So a little bit about this meeting. Uh, the format is a very interactive format. Please participate. I think we have a... So we're currently sitting at uh, a little under 20 people, which I think is enough that we can just, yeah, speak up when you've got uh, something to contribute. Um, yeah, also discussion for, for preference, putting discussion in the nurse user Slack rather than the Zoom Slack is good because then the discussion sort of continues past the meeting and still uh, visible afterwards. Uh, and for this, we'll mostly use the webinars channel. So hashtag webinars in the nurse user Slack. So we'll follow our normal agenda this month, which is start out with a, a win of the month and followed by today I learned. So some opportunities to talk about what uh, you've achieved and learned recently. Uh, a few announcements and calls for papers. Topic of the day, I seem to have uh, missed filling this in on the slides. But so for today, we're going to take a, a little bit of a look at NERSC's annual report and particularly you know, the processes and how we do it and what's what's uh, yeah, interesting and, and useful about it, yeah, particularly from a NERSC user's perspective. Uh, and then to finish up with upcoming meetings and a quick look at last month's numbers. So for our first regular session uh, section, we'll begin with the win of the month. Actually, uh, very important first off, uh, everybody can in fact see the slides and hear me. Everything's working correctly. Yes. I saw a, I saw a thumbs up there, so that's good. Yes. Great to hear. So, win of the month. The idea of this segment is to show off something that you've achieved or shout out something that you know somebody else has achieved. Uh, so for instance, you might've had a paper accepted. Um, you might've you know, simply solved a bug that's been you know, challenging for uh, a little while. Uh, you might have a significant scientific achievement. Um, could be something that's also a candidate for a high impact scientific achievement award or for an innovative use of high, high performance computing award or for a science highlight. Uh, basically, yeah the whole range where interested in sharing small wins as well as big wins. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to uh, showcase? So I could kick something off with uh, most of both my wins and, and you know, lessons learned in the last couple of weeks have been uh, around setting up an uh, update of the SPAC instance for NERSC. So you may have heard of SPAC before, it's the supercomputing, supercomputer package management software. So it's a tool for building software, essentially building you know, third-party software for you know, both to help us install software that's available for everybody, but uh, we also are trying to set things up and we in fact have a um, spec instance uh, available at the moment. You can do a module avail spec and that's what I'm working on uh, updating. And you can use spec to, in a lot of cases, uh, fairly easily install third-party software in your own home directory uh, for your own use. And it gives you a lot of uh, flexibility to install you know, exactly the version and you know, variant compiler options and so on that you need for your software. And there's a, a lot of built-in recipes that you know, can simplify the process of getting it working. So a lot of my uh, successes in the last couple of weeks have come around you know, getting steps in updating spec to work and getting it to yeah, build some software successfully. And uh, you know, in the next few days, hopefully we'll have a, a, an updated module with a newer version that has uh, yeah, some significant improvements. Uh, most of my challenges have come from it as well. Does anyone else have a story to share? Robert, you gave a wave. 
Hi. Well, I just wanted to mention um, that I uh, was able to uh, use Corey to uh, solve a problem that I've been working on. Uh, I uh, am involved in the de development of beam, uh, beam dynamics codes that are um, essentially codes that do high order perturbation theory around a reference trajectory. And, and I specifically developed Lie algebraic beam transport codes and uh, using Mathematica on NERSC, I was uh, able to uh, uh, essentially use the baker campbell house baker campbell hausdorff theorem to generate formulas that are needed to compose two Lie algebraic maps through uh, up to 10th order. And then uh, I had Mathematica write out those formulas and I coded them into a program that I then tested uh, uh, using using Cori for the calculation and and uh, and it works. So I just wanted to point out how Cori having all these features available, not just big computer power, but also access to Mathematica right there made it possible for me to generate these formulas, write them, and then have Mathematica spit out the program, spread out the long uh, computer code and paste it into another code that I then submitted to a job on Cori and, and it all worked. So, uh, so that, that's, that's really interesting. If, I, if I'm interpreting right, I'm, I'm actually hearing kind of several, um, what would you call it? Yeah, interesting aspects. And, and there's, a, there's a whole sort of story of application of um, algorithm development here. It, is that correct? So, so you've used Mathematica by the sounds of it to prototype a new algorithm that you're developing and 10th order, that's, that's hugely precise, right? <laughs> I actually used Mathematica to write the formulas. Um, the, the formulas themselves that, at each order, the size grow, the number of terms grows dramatically, and um, it is you know, quite doable to do calculations through orders of a few, four or five, uh, yes. by hand. But beyond that, um, it, it would be an incredibly tedious thing to do. Um, yeah. But uh, basically. Uh, the starting point for this was um, an online uh, document written by Alex Drock, which is about a 2,700 page document on Lie algebraic <laughs> methods and nonlinear <laughs> dynamics. If anyone's interested, I could, I could post the link to it. Um, and that document uh, describes the uh, steps in an algorithm to uh, to uh, calculate the concatenation formulas order by order, right? Uh, and uh, and then I was able to reuse some existing Mathematica code that I found in a paper on the right nested CBH formula. Uh, and so uh, I didn't exactly use Mathematica to prototype. I used Mathematica to actually write the formulas that are needed in the code. Right, I see. And so then the code it generated was was kind of Mathematica code, so to speak. But exactly. And then I pasted it into, into the computer code I was developing uh, yeah. and, and then tested it on Cori. That sounds right. How how long did the job need to run for that? Oh, this is a this is a nothing job. This is a quick job because um, uh, I mean a few seconds. But these formula because the con, the concatenator acts on them. Oh, does it take a few seconds? Yeah, a few seconds. The concatenator at the moment is not the computational bottleneck. But when you are actually tracking particles, then the if you're doing a multi-particle simulation, the parallelization is over the particles. Uh, 
Um, yeah. The concatenator itself, it, it doesn't take very long unless you consider a few seconds a long time, which could be a long time uh, if you have to do thousands and thousands of concatenations. But for this test, I just wanted to see if the high order concatenator was working. So I yeah. generated a, a Lie algebraic map through 10th order, and then I inverted the map. And then I composed the two maps and I verified that I got the identity mapping back. Uh, so that's how I have yeah. some confidence that it was done right. It sounds great. Yeah, so it's a, a productivity tool then. Yeah, mm -hmm. able to use it too. With Mathematica, since I usually just use it to solve equations and stuff on my laptop, but not really to do heavy lifting like that. Just wondering if uh, the Mathematica kernel is parallel so is there a way to speed it up using multiple nodes or multiple CPUs or whatnot? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, although for my purposes, that was not such an issue. Um, there, there was a time over the past week or two when I did run Mathematica jobs up to eight hours because I didn't realize that there was a way to make my jobs run faster. Uh, and it, if you'd asked me then, I would have said, I sure wish it would run faster. But now I can generate the, uh, the 10th order formulas with Mathematica running in a minute. So uh, I don't know, maybe somebody else can comment on whether Mathematica has parallel capabilities in it, I, that I don't know. Uh, I have to admit, I don't know either. It's possible somebody else does here, but but the like the productivity and the developing the algorithm sort of capabilities and and success there sounds really good. I, I just I don't happen to have Mathematica on my laptop. I happen to have it on, on one of my ancient laptops, but <laughs> not on the laptop I'm using now. And so it would just made it was very convenient to log in to NER, to nurse do module load Mathematica generate my formulas and paste them into the code right there. So, and yeah, these, and these formulas are uh, uh, you know, hundreds of lines long at their worst mm. uh, and a few <laughs> lines long at the best. I have a question okay. about running Mathematica on NERSC. Would that run on the login notes? And, and how much of a strain would that be on the login notes? That's probably a question for NERSC staff. Um, so, so judging from like the, the use case that Robert just described, that to me sounds like a you know a perfectly reasonable use of login nodes. You know, it's even um, if it it's does for does development, it's it's take, not computation intensive. Sorry, keep going. But if that takes like eight hours, an overnight Mathematica job, I think Mathematica sometimes can use a lot of memory yeah i think if you're getting to um you know where where you're using mathematica for that kind of heavy computational lift um running it running it on you know through the batch system would would certainly be better because it's a, a you know a little bit too much for a um a shared login node um so for up to four hours we've got the interactive queue which is a reasonably fast way of kind of you know getting onto a compute node uh, you would probably need to set things up a little bit using, you know, for instance, NX, so that you've got a decent uh, GUI connection uh, if you're using the, you know, the GUI for it. Um, but you, know, you can also run interactively just through the regular queue. It just can take longer for the job to get in and be a little bit more unpredictable um, in, you know, in terms of when you need to be there to, to start it off if there's an interactive component. But yeah, I, I think there's a, a degree of you know, sensible judgment there. Right, yeah, um, right. You know, yeah, by, by all means for development work and, and so on like that. Um, that's a that's a great use of the login nodes as yeah, as yeah. the yeah, as the intensity starts to go up. Um, and and actually if you have sort of you know, questions along the way, you know, how do I make good use of the compute nodes? Um, send us a ticket because we've got the you know, lots of experts in lots of different areas who can kind of help to you know set up something that works well for you.
That was really good. Um, so going on into the flip side of the question is the, the today I learned. And this is kind of an opportunity to, you know, celebrate and learn from the things that didn't go so smoothly. Um, there's this old saying I read once that, that I really liked, which is that, you know, knowledge comes from reading the fine print and wisdom comes essentially from not reading the fine print. And, and, and yeah, this, this in a way is kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, things that you've discovered, it doesn't have to be the hard way. It can be, um, you know, an interesting presentation that you saw that, um, you know, th you think is worth, uh, you know, calling out and telling other, other NERSC users about. Um, yeah, does anybody have an interesting story of, you know, something that they learned that they'd like to pass on a lesson? So I mentioned that both of you know, most of my successes and most of my struggles in the last couple of weeks have come with from working with uh, with SPAC. And, you know, and one of these, so I uh, learned a little bit about um, you know, Git procedures, cherry picking specific pull requests to you know pull just a particular change into you know an earlier tagged version to get you know, something to work without actually using the cutting edge development. Uh, version of everything and uh, fortunately it wasn't too hard although I did manage to you know mess it up the first time I have to you know, go back in and carefully pull out just the pull request files that I was interested in. So Sadeep I have one thing to share. Sure. Okay so I, I just uh, sent a line in the chat room so uh, what's oh, happened is, nice. yeah, so I actually a long time ago, um, when we switched the linking default on Cori as a dynamic, actually I compiled VASP dynamically and it was, um, you know, running out of memory on KNL nodes. It was okay on Haswell nodes, but on KNL it runs to OOM. It's not like a normal OOM means like, it's really like a, because of the large memory use. It's like no matter what you use, it always uh, run into OOM. So I, I opened a gray case and involved many people to investigate this. But uh, I mean, last, I think it's a couple of days ago, I ran into this solution from my module file, which existed for so many years since KNL on the board actually. So what's happened is this environment, uh, it's called a fast memory limit, is used to control the size of the memory that MKL can use uh, for you know the, the, the MCD RAM. I'm sorry, let me start mm -hmm. off. So this environment variable is, is used to limit the MCD RAM memory for MKL. So if we don't use this, then it will just use its unlimited Intel MKL can use whatever available just to use unlimited memory, uh, MCD yeah. RAM memory. So after, you know, set this, the OOM problem is resolved. So actually this has been bothering me like many months and especially we need to use dynamic linking for checkpoint restart tool. So this was really, you know, bothered me for a long time. But now I think with this workaround, the problem is resolved. So I think if uh, any users who, whoever use MKL on KNL, and if you run into OOM, probably you consider to set this environment variable. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Is this related to the fact that we have our MCD RAM set up in cache mode? Like is, is MKL tripping over because it's trying to explicitly allocate um, MCD RAM memory? Uh, I know? think so. The cache mode is, I mean, users that don't have the control, right? But the MKL uh, trying to use this mem kind to you know, control the memory use in the MCD RAM. And then somehow yeah. it, I don't know for whatever reason, it doesn't work 
I think from the beginning, I guess. So actually this environment module is something, I, I mean, this environment variable is something I adopted from uh, my early Intel, you know, collaborators. Yeah. yeah, I never thought much and kind of forgot about this environment variable. And then because we have been using static linking, it didn't bother me for a long time, right? Mm. And, and since we switched then, yeah, just to realize this all yeah. and related to this. So yeah, that's a that's a good tip. And the and the symptom that we should watch for is if you're seeing um, out of memory OOM uh, crashes in the job, particularly with dynamic linking and on K and L, uh, and you're using MKL, it could be that this is the cause and the solution. Correct. Yeah. Thanks, MG. Yeah, that's a, that's quite a useful tip. I see in the chat, uh, Robert's put a link to the book. This is the 2700 page book. Yes, that's, I don't know that's, if it's getting, quite a, an impressive it's piece getting of work. longer by the day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of great, uh, good material in there, great material in there. Just Yeah. Does anybody else have a uh, lesson or tip they'd like to share? No, we'll move on to our next item, which is announcements and uh, calls for participation. So we have a, a few things that are in the weekly email. There are other things also in the weekly email, but a, a couple that I think are, are good to call out. Um, this year we have the well, it used to be called quarterly allocation reductions. And I don't know if they're specifically quarterly anymore, but there's a, a couple of allocation reduction dates uh, and they're set for May 4 and September 7. And what these are is because, you know, predicting exactly how much you're going to need, um, you know, several months in advance is not necessarily uh, easy. And so we kind of, you know, monitor uh, the, the the burn rate, I guess, for different projects for their um, nurse hours uh, allocations and projects that are you know not on track to use up their entire allocation will have a, a small reduction in what's allocated to them on yeah as of these dates. Um, Steve, I'm, I'm that, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Um, I'm not seeing the slides advance. Oh, the slide didn't get your title yeah. slide. Uh, there you go. That's interesting. So it's been sitting on the title slide the entire time. Oh, I have to watch that a little bit more closely. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, so if you have any sort of questions about the allocation reductions and, and the reductions sort of you know, go back into the pool so that the program managers are able to, you know, reallocate the yeah you know, the unused time to uh, your other projects that need it. Um, I guess there there are some circumstances where perhaps you you know that your project is going to use most of its allocation during a, a very short time of the year, and it might be after May four. So you know if if you do have these known circumstances, you can um, you know, get in contact with us via a ticket to talk about it. Yeah, I guess that's just a heads up that those allocate those uh, dates are set. We have a couple of training events coming up. Um, on May 7, there's a, a training event for the MANA, which is MPI agnostic. I've forgotten what the, the, the next part stands for. Um, Zenji Network can probably agnostic. talk a little more about this. Network agnostic, um, transparent checkpointing, Tool. Do you want to say anything else about that, Zinji? Uh, not, not really. It's just uh, something where it's like long overdue, like a kind of a training. We all we we promised to provide this training. I think a year ago, kind of. But now finally we are ready to you know provide this training. Yeah, I hope um, if you are interested in join the training. Sounds good. Yeah. So um, if your application is is amenable to being checkpointed and, and mana for I think a lot of applications will 
you know, will sort of you know, do it automatically. Um, this can be a really good way to make, um, I guess, better, tighter use of gaps in the queue. Um, we also have a tutorial coming up at, uh, very soon, actually, uh, in April, so next week, uh, for time memory. I think that's how you pronounce it. And that's um, a, a tool that's been developed uh, within NERSC. I don't know if Jonathan's on the call at the moment. I don't think he is. Um, but so this is a, a tool for you know, analysis of the uh, you know, performance and memory use of your application. And so we have a, a tutorial as part of, part of the ECT, the ECP uh, program for that coming up. Normally, this meeting happens the day after the scheduled maintenance, but just because of you know, when Tuesdays and Thursdays and Wednesdays happen this month, um, the scheduled maintenance for Corey is next Wednesday, so it's the heads up of that. And you've probably already, already noticed um, that the HPSS archive system is currently in a maintenance which is uh, soon to finish. Steve, it actually just came back like oh, half an hour ago. Yeah, yeah it came a little early. Yeah. It came back early. That's great. So, uh, yeah, you can uh, return to archiving things, especially to you know, not have them on, on scratch for too long and avoid uh, you know, losing data to purging. Um, so before we go into the topic of the day, is there any other announcements or CFPs that uh, anybody here would like to make? Okay. Um, so topic of the day, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about NERSC's annual report. So, uh, anybody who's been a NERSC user for you know, more than just a year will have seen NERSC's annual survey. Uh, anybody who's submitted tickets will have seen the post ticket surveys. Um, we make these sort of you know, calls regularly for nominations for awards and science highlights. And you know, maybe you've wondered what does NERSC actually want all this stuff for? So, for today, we're going to take a bit of a sneak peek at NERSC's annual report, um, basically uh, why we do it, why we uh, call for these things, why we write a report, how we use the various data that we gather, and perhaps most importantly, how you can use, uh, I guess, this information and, and you know, knowledge of what NERSC's kind of, you know, goals and aims are to improve NERSC's ability to support your needs. So everyone's got a boss, uh, yeah, individuals, teams, right up to organizations. Everyone's answerable to, to you know, some stakeholder. And for NERSC, our immediate stakeholder is the DOE Office of Science. So the good news is that what the DOE wants from NERSC is for us to be able to demonstrate that um, what NERSC provides is helping its users to you know, succeed in furthering DOE research goals which roughly translates as we win when you win. Uh, and, a, and a significant component of this is the annual report that we submit to DOE every year, um, where we you know, basically analyze and write about what happened at NERSC and the um, you know, services and resources that NERSC provides and, you know, and outcomes from things like the user survey. So we actually have a, a section in our web pages with the annual reports. 2020's report isn't there yet. It has been a bit of a, a focus of activity here for a few weeks now, and uh, it will fairly soon be added to this list, but you can see past reports by going to this link here. So, um, what the DOE wants from NERSC is for us to demonstrate that um, yeah, the, the facilities and, and resources we're providing are effective for um, our users to you know, advance, um, advance your research. And we've kind of got, broadly speaking, two tools for doing this. One is to find out what our users have achieved and showcase it. And the other is 
find out what impedes our users from making progress or you know, what makes it difficult and you know, identify things that we can improve to you know, cause more success. So showcasing user achievements, one kind of yeah, almost, almost blunt instrument here, but that's an important one is uh, simply counting publications. So, you know, more published research is more evidence that DOE's investment in NERSC is reaping dividends, you know, with the, the uh, subtext there of, yeah, so it's worth investing more. Um, yeah, this comes up fairly early in the report. In 2020, we identified uh, a little over 1,800 articles, I think it was something like 1,830 or 1,860 articles that cited uh, NERSC as um, you know, a resource that was used or for support in their research. And so this, of course, bounces into, you know, how you can help, which is um, publish stuff that's, that's, that's great for you. And it's also great for us, especially if uh, you can add some uh, citation that acknowledges a use of NERSC resources in there. So when we uh, do the report, you know, we, we essentially uh, do searches on you know, publicly available databases of published articles, or available databases anyway, of published articles. And you know, we're looking for particular citations. And so we have a page here of how you can cite NERSC and uh, I guess following that format makes it easier for us to find your research and to yeah, for your work to be counted. Then getting kind of more focused is this is where things like the science highlights and the awards come in. So for uh, you know, particular work that's been done using, using NERSC, it can be really good to have a, a highlight that uh, you know, really showcases a particular project and what was attempted, what was achieved, and how NERSC resources or you know, involvement helped in that effort. So this is also kind of a, you know, a little bit of a win-win because by uh, you know, showcasing particular research that also you know, brings the successes of that of that uh, research project into the DOE sites as well. And you know, it was also kind of a, a nice you know, point to be able to show off for you know, uh, collaborators and potential collaborators and you know, others in the field. Here's uh, something, something significant that we've done. So there's another one that uh, we have on our webpage under the science tab on www.nursc. Uh, there's a bunch of links down there including some links to uh, these uh, science highlights. And, and these tend to be formatted as a slide in a, a reasonably predictable format. Uh, we have an example of it here, for instance, uh, with a, you know, a scientific achievement, what the significance is, and some details of the research and links to you know, who did it, who was involved. Um, there's a few other things on that page as well. So there's, there's some sort of vignettes, which are you know, slightly more detailed than the science highlights of some projects. Uh, also from this page are links to where you can nominate uh, particular achievements. So uh, NERSC gives out a couple of uh, achievement awards for uh, you know, high impact science and for innovative use of high performance computing. And this is you know, another way for both you know, us to demonstrate to the DOE and I guess the wider public that um, yeah, this is a, a valuable resource and for you to be able to demonstrate that you're making good use of it and you know, the, the successes of, uh, of your own work. So how you can help here is nominate something. You can, you can self-nominate or uh, nominate work that you know that somebody else, a colleague, or you know, another project you've encountered has done. And we have a, a link down here, which is all uh, under this science tab on the NERSC webpage for the nomination form. So then on the other uh, side of it, we have uh, 
you know, seeking and acting on user feedback. And this is where we come into all the different surveys and, and you know, so forth that we uh, spread around. So NERSC's annual survey, you will have seen, we've been doing it for a long time, which means we've built up quite a history of data. And it's, it's changed a few times over that time. Uh, mostly, mostly really to make it easier to fill out. Because I think over time, you know, people are getting more and more requests for surveys. And, and I think this does prompt a question of, you know, why do they want this? What are they doing with it? So in NERSC's annual survey, it's, uh, it's gratifying to see that um, users are, have consistently over time reported quite high satisfaction. So what these two lines here are, this is a historical graph, it's a little bit uh, too small to see very easily, but it goes back to, I think so it goes back to something in the order of 20 years. And you know, we have a, a target, which is uh, roughly corresponds to, you know, moderately satisfied or above. And the yeah, average score over the years has been uh, consistently higher than it. Uh, one change that happened in the last couple of years is we, we switched from a seven point scale to a six point scale. And this is all you know, part of the report is explaining that our uh, methodology is valid. And in the last couple of years, we've been working with a survey company called MBRI. So you, you might uh, see that in the uh, survey questions or in the survey, uh, what do you call it, solicitation. Uh, and they're, you know, they're experts on doing surveys and how to design the survey to, you know, make sure that we're getting, you know, valid and useful uh, answers and, you know, that it's, uh, I guess, a, a reasonable and you know, hopefully not uh, too large uh, uh, time um, commitment from users to fill out. So, and there are uh, different categories that the results get broken down into and it's, yeah, also sort of gratifying to see that um, the average scores that we're, we're seeing reported are you know, consistently um, quite high actually. So, uh, so actually we would like to thank our users for being very um, you know, uh, gener generous and uh, helpful in your feedback with that. The other aspect of the survey is the text questions. And this is a little, small to read, but um, so we ask a few text questions about you know, what does nurse do well and, and what can nurse do to serve you better? And we do a mixture of, or, or rather you know, with the, the help of the survey experts, we do a mixture of uh, analysis of both the, the scoring sort of questions and the text questions to try to understand basically you know, what uh, is working and we should keep on doing and what is not working or could use improvements. And so, you know, both the scores and the text is really helpful for this. The, the text is good because, you know, that uh, is an opportunity for you to describe in, in more detail, you know, what, uh, you know, works or doesn't work and why. And uh, you may find in, in the coming weeks, possibly even in recent weeks, um, that nurse, um, staff might contact you about uh, things that you've uh, said on the survey, yeah, you know, to try to understand better, you know, what it is that we can work on. So how you can help is fairly uh, straightforward. Here is uh, participating on uh, participate in the survey, um, and you know when something works or doesn't work, uh, you know, describing it in the text is is actually quite helpful to us. You know, and particularly the yeah, actionable sort of description, things, things of, yeah, you know, here's, here's an example of, you know, something that I did that I yeah, struggled with and this was why. Yeah, that, that sort of gives us something that we can focus on a little bit. So in this analysis, um, you know, we dive down into the factors that, uh, according to the, the statistics from the scores and from the analysis of the text, are uh, you know pain points and and things that we would like to focus on in the next year and so for 2020 the key points so q8 times are kind of always a key point that's a, a little bit of a pain point for users and and that's kind of hard to avoid it's because it's you know it, it's fundamentally caused by 
finite resources. The, uh, there are, we have a lot of uh, nurse users doing a lot of projects, uh, a finite number of resources. And so of course, you know, there is a queue and it can be long. The approaches that NERSC has been taking to try to you know, alleviate some of this, but part of it is you know, buying for ever more resources. Uh, but the other part is tuning and tweaking things. So uh, we make adjustments, for instance, to you know, queue settings, uh, queue policies, to try to increase the system utilization because um, you know, cycles where a, CPU, a compute node is sitting idle, yeah, that doesn't help anybody. So the better utilization overall we can get, that, the better that means that uh, jobs are getting through the queue. So what uh, else can you do? Um, going back to showcase your work, you know, that helps to make a uh, case for more money and, and bigger resources. But also in the, the everyday day-to-day, -day, as a general tip, shorter, wider jobs tend to work better with the scheduler. And if your work is amenable to it, and this is where the, the transparent checkpointing can, can really help as well, uh, take a look at flex jobs and using checkpointing to you know, work with a scheduler and use the gaps in the schedule. And this uh, you know, increases the utilization, you know, decreases the overall waste, and it gets everybody's job through a little bit faster. Um, another thing that users called out is documentation. And, and this is an interesting one because it tends to get called out both favorably and as a point of difficulty. And it seems that the uh, Overall summary might be that NERSC has some really detailed documentation, but it's quite complex and it can be challenging, especially for new users to you know, get up and started. So that, uh, that was useful for us to discover and um, it was part of the, the motivation behind, you may have noticed we have uh, consulting appointments. And one of the consulting appointments is uh, Nurse 101. These are all under, uh, I did put, uh, there's a link down here actually, um, on help.nurse.gov, down on the uh, left-hand side, you can book a consulting appointment and there's a list of types of, of appointments. And so for new users, the Nurse 101 might be a, a good one. To, you know, one-to-one -one getting started. Uh, we're also working to improve the documentation, you know, particularly with new users in mind. Uh, and here's where our uh, existing users can join the effort actually. So the nurse docs are actually kept in and hosted via a public GitLab repo, which means that you can go in there and you know, make edits and pull requests and uh, possibly even file issues. I don't have to check that. But on docs.nurse.gov, if you look up in the top right-hand corner, um, kind of where this little red mark here, there's a link to the GitLab uh, repository of the docs source. Uh, the other thing that users called out as being a, a pain point was downtimes. Um, and this is, this is somewhat uh, understandable. It's just disruptive when the machine's unavailable. Uh, especially at the moment, you know, since Edison retired and while we're still preparing Perlmutter, uh, we don't have a second system, which means that when there's a scheduled maintenance on Cori, uh, you know, there's not really a, uh, a plan B available. So we're anticipating that things will improve in the near future here um, with Perlmutter, partly for the simple reason that, you know, there will be two systems. And so, you know, if one of them is, uh, you know, if Corey is down for maintenance, Perlmutter will still be available. And the other is, uh, yeah, Perlmutter is, uh, some, has some uh, significant uh, differences, I guess, in its uh, operating system. It's a, a Shasta operating system, so it's kind of a new um, approach from Cray. And one outcome of this is that we expect the maintenance is to be a lot less disruptive. So uh, for the most part, we are anticipating that maintenance sh shouldn't require a full shutdown of the machine. So we're anticipating kind of uh, some less disruptive downtimes 
Uh, so in terms of uh, what you can do here, probably being ready for Perlmutter is the, you know, the biggest and most obvious thing. Uh, we have a, a bunch of docs, particularly so if you're developing code and uh, looking at performance, under uh, performance here in the docs, there's a Perlmutter readiness page, which has lots of tips. Um, you can also try things out early. Um, we have a, a small development system with a handful of nodes that have GPUs, which are not exactly what Perlmutter will have, but it's sort of in that direction. And so if you're uh, you know, testing out your workflows or developing code uh, using Corey's GPU development nodes is a, a good way to you know, get a bit of a feel of it there and feel for it there. And you, you can request access to those also via the help system uh, under the open request button here in the, here at help.nurse.gov. So I think from a, those are the things that uh, I guess jumped out to me as being you know, particularly interesting things for you know, our uh, user community and you know, things that uh, perhaps you can uh, you know, take some sort of action about. Um, there are no doubt many other things that are interesting there. So other parts of the annual report uh, go through some of our operational numbers. Uh, so yeah, we, we kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, bounce off this a little bit for the last month numbers section of this meeting, which is coming up actually in a moment. Uh, there's a section of the report where we talk about innovations that are happening at NERSC uh, to improve NERSC's operations and also usability. So this is, this is almost kind of, you know, research into, um, or, or yeah, yeah, research and development intended to improve user experience in coming years. So it's, it's quite a long report, but you know, there's some interesting stuff there to read and uh, it will soon be available at this webpage. Uh, ultimately, I think the, you know, the key thing here is that um, you know, with, with the uh, annual report being a fairly significant part of it, NERSC is reviewed based on how well we're able to support the success of our users. So, yeah. It helps us if you're doing well and, and you, know, you, can, you can contribute, you can help nurse by making your successes known, um, you know, nominating work and uh, citing nurse in publications and also letting us know in surveys and you know, whatever other forums, but particularly surveys because that gives us a, you know, a, a body of work that we can analyze and you know, sort of, uh, uh, focus on a bit. Um, and you know, let us know what works well and what poses difficulties. And that helps us to direct our efforts to improve support kind of in coming years. So that's my kind of quick summary of the, um, or preview of the 2020 report. Here's what the front page looks like. There are quite a few pages. Um, what have we got? 122 pages. So. Uh, we probably don't have time to go into too many details of, of the actual content in this discussion, but uh, we do have a few minutes for um, if anybody has any uh, questions or comments I'd like to make you know, about uh, the process or you know, uh, I guess things of interest in the report. Too much all in one mouthful. In the meantime, though, yeah, do go uh, take a look at this link, and you know, a uh, uh, flick through the uh, 2019 report might be a good way of getting an overview of the sort of things we asked. Um, oh, I see. There's a couple of comments in the chat here. Yeah. It might be useful in compiling the annual report to have an expectation that proposals for allocations include citations of papers within the past year. 
Um, thanks, Devin. That's a good point, actually. And you know, I don't actually know if we specify that in the ERCAP process, but it probably would be a good thing to add that uh, a pointer to where and how to cite NERSC. That's, uh, that's a good note. S somewhat related to that, it's not only that when compiling proposals, I think you should include citations of papers that used NERSC. I know that some of the other centers only consider papers that not only use their resources, but also have the acknowledgements in that paper. Um, as in only consider projects or? No, or... If, if I have a paper that uses say argon time, but I don't acknowledge using argon time in the paper, then argon yep. would not consider counted for their papers that were based on their, their computing resources. Right. Yes, I, I think we do have that, that same, uh, I guess, what do you call it, factor, almost almost limitation in right. that the way we discover these papers is by searching for citations. Right, but it, it for require the aircap uh, process that people list what what was used that that only includes the ones that actually cite it or acknowledge it, I should say. Oh. Oh, I see. As in, as in, yep. Yeah, when when OCAP proposals list previous work, right, right, yep. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, so we're coming close to the top of the hour. We have a couple of. Uh, sections left coming up we're always looking for um, topics uh, either either requests or suggestions for a topic of the day if you've got some work you'd like to showcase um, so, so something that i would really like to see is some of some more of these topic of the days being nurse users uh, showing off what what you've achieved and so you know, if you have something that you're interested in doing a you know, 10 or 15 minute essentially lightning talk about the work that you're doing, even if it's work in progress, uh, the work that you're doing and how you're using NERSC resources you know, with maybe some you know, tips and ideas that other users can um, bounce off about you know, things that you've found work. Um, I think that would make a really interesting topic of the day. So you know, please let us know. Um, I see, ah, Chris is uh, posted in the chat. Actually, this is, this is a good idea. Uh, how to edit and contribute to nurse documentation as a monthly topic. That would be a good topic, actually. We can do a, a walkthrough of the, uh, the system. So we use a system called MCDOCS, MKDOCS, and uh, it's essentially markdown formatted documentation in a, a Git repository that we accept pull requests for. So yeah, that, that would be a good topic, a, a walk through how to contribute. Thanks, Koji. And finally, uh, last month's numbers. So March uptime wise, we had a, a really good month. We had uh, no unscheduled downtimes. I think the message of the day did show one unscheduled downtime, but it turned out to be a, a false alarm. It uh, triggered on utilization dropped, and it was uh, simply that a very large job was getting ready to start and uh, a lot of nodes had to be cleared. So the only downtime that we had was the scheduled maintenance. The utilization, so the, the large jobs was actually up a little bit from normal. Um, our target is, I think, 25% of the workload being large jobs, so um, work that can't progress without a really large scale system such as Cori. Um, utilization was high, but you know, in, in recent months, it's actually been sitting up around the kind of, you know, 94, 95%. And I kind of wonder if part of the, you know, the relative dip is because, uh, you know, large jobs can have sort of, you know, gaps scheduling around them. But this is where 
Uh, this is partly why we're keen for things like flex jobs, which can fill in those gaps. What's your definition of large? Uh, our official definition of large, I think, is 1,024 or more nodes. Okay. So, and I think we particularly only consider jobs on the KNL nodes for that because uh, there are only about two, a little over 2,000 Haswell nodes. So, the, the kind of half of the machine. Uh, I might need to, to verify that. I think we, we do have it in the, in the policies written on the, in the documentation. But yeah, so, um, so 1,024 job uh, nodes plus counts as a large job and also becomes eligible for a, a discount in the, the job cost. Um, new tickets, yeah, a, a chart of how these tickets move over, over time would probably be interesting. Um, the, the numbers do tend to be reasonably consistent in the in sort of, yeah, five to 700 a month. Uh, new tickets, closed tickets. So our current backlog as of a couple of weeks ago was a little over 500 tickets in flash. And that's all we have for today. And it's right at the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining us and look forward to seeing you all again next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye. Oh,